Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I am Mel Bradnam, and I'm the manager of the Institute of Infection. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our launch. We're really excited for what the next two days will bring. Um, before we be officially begin, I want to note some housekeeping notices. One is that um, the event is being recorded and it will be made publicly available. Um, it's also being Hi. currently live streamed. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. The other thing to note. I'm Mel Bradman, I'm the manager of the Institute of Infection. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our launch. We're really excited for what the next two days will bring. Um, before we officially begin, I want to make some housekeeping notices. One is that um, the event is being recorded and it will be made publicly available. Um, it's also being mm -hmm. currently live streamed. The other thing to know is that there will be an opportunity for audience questions at the end of the panel discussion later this afternoon. So if you want to submit a question, please use the Q&A facility on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and also just note if there is a function to post anonymously if you do not want your name to appear. Um, and with that said, I would like to hand you over to President Gast who can launch the event officially. Um, so thank you everyone and thank you Pro um, Professor Gast. Thank you very much, Mel. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and dear colleagues. It is my pleasure as president of Imperial College London to welcome you to this momentous event. Today we are launching a critical new institute at a critical time for the world. Imperial College London excels at fundamental research, quality education, and rapid innovation. We bring our strengths to bear on the hardest problems faced by society, and we pursue this work in broad and meaningful collaborations across disciplines, across institutions, across sectors, and across national borders. It is thus fitting that we celebrate this launch with a symposium, a symposium gathering some of our world-leading medics, scientists, engineers, and economists who are delving into the critical issues we face and the ways we will deal with them. Today, we are honored to have with us the Chair of the Wellcome Trust and former Prime Minister of Australia, the Honorable Julia Gillard, to provide keynote remarks. Welcome to Imperial, Julia, and thank you for your support. We, will look, we look forward to your insightful words. It is also entirely appropriate that we have a discussion with an amazing panel today. A panel filled with our academics who have become household names thanks to their tireless and pivotal work throughout the pandemic. You will hear about exciting work at the cutting edge of predicting, understanding, detecting, treating, and preventing infections. Our Institute of Infection builds upon our deep history of infection research and innovation from Sir Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin at St. Mary's Hospital in 1928, to our leadership in providing multidisciplinary solutions to antimicrobial resistance and the scourge of malaria. The extraordinary circumstances of the past two years underline the critical need for us to remove barriers to collaboration and to bring new ideas and new people together to deal with the most complicated of infections. Many institutions talk about their collaborations. We get down to work pursuing them. In January 2020, a group of experts around the world woke up to the realization that COVID-19 was serious. The first paper from Neil Ferguson's group showed clearly that human to human transmission was happening and set off an alarm as it was already spreading beyond China. Early in the pandemic, our expert immunologist, Robin Shattuck, saw what was happening and turned his work on self-amplifying RNA vaccines to battle the new coronavirus. With amazing speed, Robin and his team produced a vaccine and they have been further developing their platform for other diseases. Meanwhile, our expert in biomedical materials and nanotechnology, Molly Stevens, 
shifted her exquisitely sensitive diagnostic test to focus on COVID-19. Robin and Molly have collaborators like Wendy Barkley, who studies viruses and their transmission, including the transmission to and from animals like minks. Their work feeds into the most comprehensive study of disease in the world, the REACT study, led by Paul Elliott and Ara Darzi, which has informed the UK and the world as the pandemic progresses. They also collaborate with Peter Openshaw, whose network of clinicians brings, brings essential information about the clinical indications of the disease. And Chris Chu, who leads the Human Challenge Trials, where controlled study of the disease reveals much more detail about its behavior. Meanwhile, their colleague Anthony Gordon has led efforts to evaluate treatments among the severely ill patients with COVID-19, while Danny Altman and Rosemary Boyton are investigating the lasting impacts of the disease in the form of long COVID and the havoc wrought on our immune systems. These rapid pivots, as amazing as they are, really show us the benefits of years and decades of intense research, revealing and understanding the complexity of infectious disease, its detection, its treatment, and its prevention. What we are doing today, informing this institute at Imperial College London, solidifies these foundations and propels new collaborations we believe that we will achieve even more by catalyzing research and innovation at the intersections of scientific, medical, engineering, and business disciplines at Imperial. As we look ahead, sadly still having an online meeting rather than gathering in person, we know that we need to keep up the collaborative and interdisciplinary spirit that we have grown accustomed to during the pandemic. Even with the incredible work of so many of our colleagues, the world has suffered greatly from this pandemic, and we realize that we need to be better prepared in the future. In our new Institute of Infection, we will develop that preparedness. We will bring together the talents of a wide variety of clinical, medical, engineering, natural science, and economic researchers to turn fundamental discoveries into interventions that will save and improve lives globally. We need to take our collaborative ethos even further, bringing together governments, corporations, small and large, and institutions around the world. Imperial's convening power is great. With the Institute of Infection, it will be even greater. We must also attract the very best students and colleagues to join in this exciting work. From this launch day forward, we will be creating the next generation of innovators to find new and different solutions to old problems and to bring old solutions to bear on new and different problems. It is an honor to have all of you here today as we celebrate our outstanding colleagues and launch their work into new heights. It is now my pleasure to welcome the co-directors of the Institute of Infection, Professor Charles Bangham and Professor Jake Baum, to tell you more about the Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, for your kind words. Imperial College is internationally recognized for its excellence in research on infection, both by individual investigators and in many centers of excellence within Imperial, such as Infectious Disease Epidemiology and the MRC Center for Molecular Bacteriology and Infection. And Imperial, as we've just been reminded by uh, President Gast, has made remarkable contributions in the current pandemic, especially in epidemiology and virology. It's worth emphasizing that the uh, establishment of the Institute is not in fact a, a reaction, a response to the pandemic, but of course the pandemic has given us the most po forcible possible reminder of the continuing uh, importance of infectious diseases. It's often remarked that another particular strength of Imperial is the juxtaposition of clinical medicine and biology with leading centers in physical sciences, engineering and mathematics. 
there are already some fantastic examples of collaboration between these disciplines in Imperial in different aspects of infectious research, such as that between the Department of Infectious Disease and the Department of Chemical Engineering in developing novel vaccines, as again, we've just been reminded. But it's also true that there's huge potential for more such collaboration. <clears throat> the mission of the Institute of Infection is to promote and drive this collaboration in research on infection by bringing together the workers in the different disciplines. It is often such interdisciplinary work that produces the most <clears throat> original, exciting and important results. I'd now like to introduce Professor Jake Baum to explain the broad approach that we're taking. Jake. Thank you very much, Charles, and uh, thank you to everybody for turning up today. So really just to kind of keep the theme going um, and to speak to sort of some of our diversity that we have here. We have one of the largest communities of uh, infection researchers and researchers who are ready to work in the infection space. And that, as Alice uh, um, said, is uh, across every faculty and indeed across every class of pathogen. And we have unique capacity to work with pathogens at every um, level of, of containment um, and, uh, um, and, and, and at every, pretty much every scale. So if we speak about the challenge of meeting, um, uh, meeting the challenge of global infectious diseases, uh, you're, you're hearing the theme hopefully loud and clear about the need for creative approaches and interdisciplinarity. And I think it's that profound belief that it's at the intersection between sciences that many key breakthroughs and discoveries often occur. And that's really what the Institute wants to do, to enable and, and empower researchers in those area, speaking to the missions that, that, that Charles mentioned. One of the things that you'll see throughout the meeting um, is, is a sort of a graphic device that we're using to really sort of uh, give you a feel for what we hope to achieve through the Institute. And if I just take three small concepts, uh, the disease malaria, which I'm passionate about, um, expertise in electrical engineering that you might find in the Faculty of Engineering, and then that global need for a new diagnostic device as just one example. And then you bring those together um, as intersecting ideas at the um, um, Institute of Infection, then we get that kind of radical breakthrough of a point of care digital diagnostic that you can use for epidemiological mapping um, of malaria, but also point of care diagnosis. And it's that kind of idea of bringing people together in new ratios, in new intersecting uh, ways um, that we hope will be the driver of real innovation and creativity at the Institute. <clears throat> so to achieve that, we've tried to bring together a really diverse community, um, diverse in every sense across all the um, different disciplines of science, um, across all the stages of career. Tomorrow, you'll see some of the presenters are only in the middle of their PhD, whilst others are very eminent professors. And we're really trying to encapsulate that within the community, both by having champions who represent many of the different disciplines you will hear about, and some that you won't hear about because there just isn't enough time to discuss all of our breadth of expertise. But that crosses everything from AI and machine learning to chemical engineering, to life science, down the microscope, fundamental bacteriology um, and, and, uh, and clinical um, uh, medicine too. Um, and also many of that, that diversity is also represented in the steering committee of, of the Institute, which is having to guide and develop its mission. And if we think about our, our road ahead um, as, as we head forwards as a community, it's really to try and build that both internally with things like seminars, roundtable events, sand pits, where we maybe discuss the interfaces between infection and other disciplines. Uh, for example, a discussion we're really keen to have about the intersection between climate and infection, and also supporting early career um, researchers. A key theme of the Institute will be its focus on training, both at the PhD level and continuing professional development, and what we hope is our flagship, which is an online MSc in infection, which we hope will be globally um, uh, uh, um, uh, available to students around the world. We really wanna be able to support Blue Skies research with seed funding, and to build stronger links with our external partners, which are already very well established at Imperial College. And ultimately, we hope that the Institute will be somewhat of a brand for infection at the college, where ideas can come in and we can find those partners that often do exist and are very strong already um, and, we, uh, and, and as a sort of a hub and spokes model to bring that community together. Um, starting a new Institute is also an opportunity to establish best practice, both in our support for the, the, the better of science, the early career researchers, but also to establish best practice in equality, diversity and inclusion right from the beginning and the inception of our, of our institute. And finally, just to sort of speak to our real desire that the institute is also a, a, a communication vehicle, so, a, a, a way that the uh, scientific community can interact even more, as you've already seen from many of our academics, um, engaging with the public, 
developing science communication tools and also to engaging with patients who are also make up a, a, a key component um, of, of, our, of our institute community. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Charles uh, to, to introduce our keynote speaker um, today that we're very excited to hear from. Thanks very much, Jake. It's a privilege and a pleasure to introduce uh, Julia Gillard. After training as a lawyer and appointment as a partner in her law firm before the age of 30, Julia yeah. entered politics full time in the mid 1990s and entered Australian Parliament as a member of Parliament in 1998. Between 2010 and 2013, she was leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister of Australia. And earlier this year, she took the position of chair of the Wellcome Trust. I'd like, now like to ask Julia to give her keynote speech. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this launch event. Looking at the world today, it's all too clear that the challenge of infectious diseases needs science and research needs exactly what you are doing at the Institute of Infection. 50 years ago, some scientists were concerned about infection research for a different reason. They worried it would be too dull to, appear to, to appeal to future scientists. Smallpox was on the way to eradication, polio looked like following suit, and there were vaccines for everything, or so it seemed, from the privileged position of scientists in the US and UK. They could afford to ignore endemic and neglected diseases like malaria or bilharzia, despite the draining impact these infections were having, still have today, on communities in Africa, Asia, South America. Their complacency was punctured soon enough. The emergence of HIV AIDS in the 1980s and its spread around the world, especially in the US, showed how wrong they were. As you know, no vaccine has ever worked for HIV, and despite strenuous efforts, medical treatments were a long time coming for reasons both scientific and social. HIV has been followed by a slew of other viruses that have emerged and threatened, not all successfully, thankfully, to spawn ec epidemics. Ebola, NASA, Nipah, Zika, SARS and MERS, coronaviruses, and of course, COVID-19 with its devastating and continuing toll. Infectious disease research is certainly not dull in the 21st century. You who are working on infection science are cursed, like the rest of us, I suppose, with living in exciting times. So the future of infection research is exciting and it is essential. I look at the number, not just of different COVID vaccines, but the number of ways to make new vaccines, whole virus, protein subunits, viral vectors, RNA, it's incredible. And we've seen how important it is to have multiple options ready to roll in an emergency, not just vaccines, but treatments and diagnostics, public health expertise. I've also seen the world systems and structures sometimes working to limit access to affordable products. Sometimes that's been because affordability wasn't considered important in the development stages. Other times because richer nations have hoarded the supply. That's why science can't solve a pandemic on its own. It requires engagement and mutual support from society, sometimes mediated by politicians. Prior to the pandemic, science was marginalised in politics. Expertise treated dismissively. In the often fevered debate about climate change, the science was framed as controversial, contested. Now science finds itself in demand at the very centre of the pandemic response. That's a mixed blessing. We're going to see a lot of inquiries and criticism of decisions made during the pandemic. Science will be scrutinised through a political lens and we need to prepare to engage with those processes in a positive way because it is in this way that the role of science will be set for the years ahead. Even when we are able to say we are in a post-pandemic world, we'll still need science to maintain a clear role in making decisions during times of uncertainty. In the end, I can't see any of the health challenges we still face today being solved without the concerted efforts of scientists and researchers 
front and centre. The key will be how we combine the science of different fields, different research disciplines, perspectives from different countries and communities, how we combine all that rich knowledge and experience to create new solutions as fast as we can in order to outpace the speed of a pandemic or of the increasingly harmful effects of climate change on our health or to catch up with mental health where science is making amazing discoveries all the time about the brain and how it works, but the translation of those discoveries into better treatments has been far too slow. The Institute of Infection is a fantastic example of how we can accelerate progress. So too the Rosalind Franklin Institute, developing new technologies to image life in five dimensions. That's the usual three plus time and chemistry and the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which was set up to contribute to the first human genome sequence and now applies genomic information to everything from cancer to COVID. It's all about teamwork, team science, open, inclusive, collaborative approaches. I really admire the way your goals at the Institute focus on interactions between types of expertise across science and with expertise beyond science as well. In your search for new ways to save and improve lives, it might surprise some people that you include basic discovery science in the Institute's core work. At Wellcome, we know that the most innovative ways to improve health will be found precisely through funding and supporting curiosity-led discovery research, work that starts with an open question and follows a winding path towards answers and more questions, generating new insights and understanding new tools and technologies along the way. And we know that we can't rely on one source of curiosity. We need a diverse interdisciplinary workforce spread in a research culture that is inclusive, honest and creative. I joined Welcome as chair about six months ago. What a time to start. It's not quite how I imagined it would be when I accepted the job back in early 2020. But we knew even back then, before the scale of the pandemic had become clear to everyone, before I joined, that Welcome was due a change in strategy, not to change everything, not changing anything just for the sake of it, but to focus our work on fewer goals. Supporting bold, cutting edge discovery research remains the big one. As an independent foundation, Welcome can afford to put money into research where the pathway to help health impact is not all that clear or might be on a really long time scale. So in our new schemes, which launched in August, our grants are longer and more flexible so that researchers can more easily let their curiosity lead them to discoveries. And because curiosity can lead you to cross traditional boundaries of disciplines, and because it's often those interactions that lead to the most exciting outcomes, we're looking to fund more in the physical sciences, more data science, more collaborations operating at the edge of what's possible. Ultimately, Wellcome's mission is to support research in order to improve health. So in our new strategy, we want to make sure that the science we fund is having as much of a positive impact on health as possible. Now, as well resourced as Welcome is, even we can't afford to do everything. We will spend over one billion pounds a year on our mission, but that's a drop in the ocean compared to all the research and R&D funding around the world. So we choose to focus this side of our work, the targeted activities, to make sure we use science to have impact, to focus on three of the most urgent health challenges facing everyone, mental health, infectious diseases and climate change. Because if those three challenges go unsolved, all our other efforts to improve health through research will be undermined for decades to come. Solving them will require an even larger team. Some people call it transdisciplinary, when team science joins up with business and policy and lived experience and government and the rest of civil society a big team with shared goals and a multitude of different approaches. It sounds hard, it is hard, and it's necessary too. Only by working together will we be able to harness the power of science to change the world for the better. In infections specifically, Wellcome will continue to support every stage of research, 
from discovery to phase one and two clinical trials and will seek new opportunities to help change systems in favour of affordable medicines. We're prioritising affordability, sustainability and equity across all the infections work we will support. And while centres of excellence like the Institute for Infection are vital, we also wanted to support this work happening in the communities most affected by infectious diseases, where the infrastructure for R&D is not so well developed as here in the UK. We know now not to think we can eradicate all infectious diseases or undo the harms of climate change completely or prevent anyone ever experiencing mental health problems. But at Welcome, we can see a future where no one is held back by mental health problems, where the health impacts of climate change are understood and have been minimised and a future where infections are under surveillance so we can spot the danger signs earlier and use every tool at our disposal to stop them from spreading out of control without having to sacrifice years of our lives to lockdowns all around the world. That's what we mean when we say welcome support science to solve urgent health challenges. Science is the art of the soluble after all. I finish by wishing you luck. Perhaps good scientists make their own luck, but serendipity has always had a place in science as well. You can't strategize for luck, but you can create conditions where unexpected encounters are more likely and where sparks of unanticipated inspiration can be nurtured. I see those conditions in the way the Institute of Infection has been set up. And so I look forward with great confidence to seeing the significant contributions you make towards solving the challenges of infectious diseases in the years to come. Thank you for asking me to join you. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for that really inspiring message. Um, I think we had a stroke of luck in, in getting you to, uh, to speak at our, our launch today. You've certainly uh, um, crystallized quite a few sparks of inspiration uh, for me personally anyway. And I think you've really crystallized for us um, both our goal, the vision of our goal, and also a vision of what we hope to, to, to be a part of on a global landscape. Um, and I think that's really important that we all see ourselves as part of a much larger, I guess, a community of humanity that are all working towards the same challenges. Um, and it's really, you know, it's an opportune moment to really acknowledge the amazing, um, the importance of, of our funders um, in all the research we do, of course, the welcome, but also UKRI, the MRC in particular, who've been a great backer of, of many uh, centres and research at, at Imperial and the Gates Foundation, uh, um, among several others. So now, now to sort of follow the sort of um, the inspiring opening, we're going to um, have a, a panel discussion, um, and that's going to be chaired by Professor Mary Ryan, who's the uh, Vice Provost of Research and Enterprise. Um, and we have an esteemed panel of, uh, of different academics from across college. Um, professors Wendy Barclay, Neil Ferguson, Alison Holmes, Peter Openshaw, Faith Ozier, Robin Shattuck and Molly Stevens. I think I've got everybody. Um, and, and Julia, I hope you'll stay on for, 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 for the panel discussion as well, uh, Charles and I. So I'll hand over to Mary to hopefully uh, uh, lead us in quite a lively discussion. Thanks, Jake and Charles, and thank you, Julia, for that introduction. And, and congratulations to the Institute for this formal launch. It's very exciting times. And, and as Julie said, interesting times. Um, so the Institute of Infection is an institute that's very forward looking, um, but we can't escape the recent events, the last two years. And, and I just want to really start by asking the panel to reflect on the last two years um, and, and really think about what, what have we learned that gives us, I guess, what have we learned in a positive sense? What have we learned from the way things panned out in the, in the pandemic that will be useful for the future? And what do we need in place to make sure that we can actually take on those lessons and, and implement changes? So I'm going to come to you first, Peter. Um, that's OK. I'm going to go Peter and then probably Wendy and then Neil. So Peter. Well, <laughs> thank you, Mary. I'm just thinking, you know, what has most surprised us? Things that we hadn't anticipated. And I guess for me, the first one was that vaccines really work. You know, it's it's pretty surprising, actually, as a respiratory immunologist to find that in such a short time, we have such a large number of vaccines that actually are 
remarkably effective. And I think that that is extraordinary. We didn't really anticipate that early on. You know, it was a sort of paragraph in our forward look, but we didn't really think that in a reasonable time frame we'd have anything like this in terms of vaccine success. I guess uh, another thing that maybe surprised us was how rapid it, um, the virus evolved. You know, we thought this was a relatively large, stable virus that was going to edit its own genome, was going to correct its own mistakes. You know, we thought this was going to be relatively stable. We, you know, we put in the possibility into our plan that a variants would arise, but I think it was a surprise when we started to see these quite remarkable changes in, in the virus in relatively short, short time. And I, I think the la last thing I'd like to say is another thing we really um, learned was that collaboration works. You know, collaborative research has been extraordinary in the way in which it's generated so many successes, particularly in the UK. I think, you know, the fact that we've been able to pull together people from across the UK across many, many different hospitals to do this brilliant clinical research um, that we've been part of, but not necessarily led, you know, being part of, and that that's actually been transformative and led to, you know, not only discovering new treatments that do work, but equally importantly, finding out treatments that people thought would work that didn't. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Wendy. Thanks, let me start by agreeing with Peter about the power of collaboration. Um, I think you know we're all incredibly proud to have been part of various consortia. And if you look at something like the COG UK, which is the sequencing consortia, which sequenced in the first six months more genomes here in the UK that, than the rest of the world really put together. So we, we really worked together and, and were quick off the mark with some things. But I think that, that what we also learned is that you do need to be ready to respond. Um, and I, again, I think credit should go to people like Peter Openshaw, who worked for years on putting together plans of how clinical research would respond to the next pandemic in the form of the Isseric uh, Consortia. So I think what we've learned is to rehearse in peacetime what you need to do to be ready to respond very quickly when, when the outbreak arises. Um, and I think perhaps one of the things the Institute can, can contribute to is things like diagnostics. Can we rehearse in peacetime how to develop very quick, easy to use diagnostics and then think about how to use them uh, to best effect uh, for each different type of outbreak that might come next? And just, just to follow up a little bit, Wendy, on that, do we have things in place to enable that? Is it just a question of bringing the right people together or and do we do we then have the funding in the communities? Is it a convening? How is it needed? I th I, well, I think it's both. I mean, I think after the swine flu pandemic in two thousand and nine, there were some uh, funding bodies who had the foresight to put out calls for what were almost like sleeping contracts, where people were encouraged to think about how to prepare, get a little bit of money to pull people together, and then put the plans in place. Um, and I think that was very wise, but I would like to see more of that, more of the sort of forward thinking about how we will work together. Um, and then in terms of what the Institute can do, I mean, one of the things I think Imperial did very well in terms of diagnostics was try to link together engineers who, who might have some good ideas about diagnostics with the clinicians who had access to clinical samples. And we do have the facilities and the structure to do that. But really, the purpose of the Institute is to make sure that those links are made, that people know each other and know how to operate uh, when when it really happens. OK, thanks. Neil, anything to add? Yes, I mean, taking a, a kind of broader view, the thing which surprised me and I think surprised everyone and is is a fundamental shift from the past is that politicians around the world decided that it wasn't acceptable to let a lethal pandemic like this run through the population. And I've been involved in pandemic planning for 20 years or more. And worst case, in that, I mean, pandemics, lethal pandemics have been top of the UK risk register for nearly all that time. But all the pandemic planning taking place in this country, the United States, across the European Union, focused on mitigation rather than stopping something in its tracks. And we know, of course, the 
downsides of lockdown and the consequences of it, but it has been a very effective policy at, re at reducing mortality, thankfully um, shortened by the rapid development of vaccines. But given that lesson, and given I think that lesson's going to stick with as a as a advanced species now on this planet, we're not going to allow very lethal pandemics to spread in the way they were in the past, for instance, in 1918, then that has a lot of consequences for research priorities going forward, both the 100 days agenda of the pandemic task force and coming out of G7, but also a lot of both basic and applied research to try and shorten the time between the detection of a, a pandemic and how quickly we can initially respond to slow spread, but also develop countermeasures. And I think the Institute will play a key role in delivering those tools to make the next pandemic more manageable than this last one has been. Okay, thanks. I just, almost the same question, but I'd just like to get Robin and Molly's perspective from, I guess, researchers who are working more on the, the treatment testing, more the technology, if you like, side. And the lessons that we learned in, in how to, I guess, enable rapid translation. Did we learn anything in enabling rapid translation and what might we do differently? Robin. Well, I think from the vaccine perspective, we learned a lot. Um, I think everybody was surprised by the speed. Um, and certainly we saw the advent of new technology, RNA based vaccines. Um, but I think we need to re recognise that that also required billions of dollars of very rapid investment from pharmaceutical companies. And so to make a global solution, it requires that partnership between pharma and academia. And although we've been really warmed and heartened by the speed of things, that speed in the developed world, we have fallen very short in terms of access to these new technologies in low and middle income countries. And I think that really highlights that we need to change the economics. We need to change the way we manufacture vaccines and where we manufacture vaccines and how we deliver them if we're ever going to be able to have a global response that's equitable to future pandemics. Do, and do you see those changes happening? I mean, what, what's needed to make those changes happen? Because, I, you know, in principle, I can, I can agree that you're basically saying we need an overhaul of the system, right, for translation and for manufacture. Does this have to be a, a global network, a global effort? How to, and, and is it an effort of the, the big farmer or is it an effort of governments? Where, where does the, I guess, the power and the, the agency lie to make that change? I think it does need to be a global solution. Um, and I think lots of different agencies can come into play, but I think it can also be a technological solution. Because if we think about what we're facing right now, the problem is that globally we're trying to make more vaccine doses than are made in any year for any other indication. Um, and that is a surge capacity. You can't maintain that capacity outside of a pandemic. So what we need is technology that can be rapidly scaled in different parts of the world um, with manufacturing approaches that are accessible to uh, many companies and many countries, but a regulatory architecture that means that the same vaccine can be made in you know, the African continent, the Indian continent, as well as North America and, and, and Europe. Um, and so it requires a real change in the way we think about vaccines. Um, I think that will come with uh, nucleic acid technology where the vaccine design component is in the code but the production is in the in the hardware. So in the same way that computers have made information more accessible globally, you can see that genetic sequences can be made globally available if there's a hardware then to manufacture them. Thanks. Molly, from your perspective? Yeah, I think I'd like to really highlight um, how impressed I've been, not on, only with uh, all the various group leaders, but with all the early career researchers that have really um, stepped up and showed actually a, a lot of enthusiasm and, and bravery in, in being able to very quickly pivot um, some of the research they were doing towards things that would be really useful in tackling the um, pandemic. So within my own group, probably a third of my um, group, you know, stepped up within a, a couple of days of the lockdown and 
uh, volunteered really to help on um, developing technologies that could be um, useful. So, so that sort of whole cohort of early career researchers and their their enthusiasm is is really really important. I also um, absolutely share Robin's um, passion for making technologies that are going to be important um, in uh, global health applications as well. And one of the things we've been focusing on is. Um, taking some of the diagnostics approaches that we've been developing in the lab that have very, very sensitive uh, detection technologies and really thinking about how we can design them and make them in a way that they can be portable and also affordable um, at the point of care. Um, and a lot of that work is done with a, um, a big uh, interdisciplinary research center uh, called iSense that I'm deputy director of, but also a lot of collaborations uh, with pharma and with um, uh, device design, engineering technologies and, and manufacturers. So it's a very, very collaborative effort. Could you could you maybe expand just a little bit more? I mean, you've said point of care and probably most people on the call know what that means, but just why 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 is point of care so important? I don't know if it's nationally, but from a global perspective, because I think it's, yeah. there's some interesting, interesting aspects to that. Well, what we mean by that are um, technologies that you could use um, in the field or um, at, at locations where you might not necessarily be in a, a, a GP surgery, for example. So, so making these things more accessible and ultimately um, one of our goals is to also, and we've been doing quite a lot of work on this, is to also have these technologies um, be readable by mobile phones and integrated into online uh, care pathways, which is a completely different challenge, but that's really about increasing accessibility of technologies um, across uh, populations that would need them. OK, thanks. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on a little bit and, and try to think about infections beyond the, the current pandemic. Um, and I'd really like us to try and understand as a panel where, where the panel thinks some of the biggest challenges or the biggest threats are going to be globally and in the UK. and and whether the panel think we're ready to tackle them. And I guess just also in the in the chat, we've had a, a question from Richard about what Imperial would do to make rapid progress in infectious diseases in general. So, so I mean, restate that. What are, what are the biggest threats? How are we well placed to address them? Are we well placed to address them? And, and what would Imperial do in that space? So I'm going to come to you first, Alison, if that's OK, and then Faith and then Molly. Sure. Uh, well, moving from COVID, um, maybe we could discuss another pandemic that is slightly more slow, but um, I think the issue of addressing um, antimicrobial resistance is absolutely critical here. And there's some really interesting lessons from COVID and also there's some really interesting lessons from AMR. So um, I I would propose that we need to start shifting the research agenda away from looking at drug discovery if we are really wanting to look at issues about equity in addressing antimicrobial access as well as um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and this is because we have um, the people that benefit from new drugs are very limited. If we really, really want more bang for our buck, in terms of our existing and any new antimicrobials that come along, um, we really need to look at how we can use them better. And also to benefit society um, in the broadest terms, we need to look at how we can use them better. And there are many ways to do this. Um, and um, Imperial are incredibly well placed to look at some of the technologies that could be applied to use antimicrobials, not just um, in terms of optimizing treatment and treating infections better and getting much better outcomes, um, but also how we can minimize um, the impact on AMR and preserve you know, using our tried and tested drugs much more effectively and also much more effectively in populations that are poorly served by the type of data that goes out with um, uh, antimicrobials as well. So I would make a real plug for looking at antimicrobial optimization as something that we should be doing, not just for the agents we have now, but any that should be coming along. And the, although my focus varies mainly on antibacterial agents, in this we can include antiviral agents, um, antiparasitic agents, and importantly, antifungals, um, and also all the ways we can prevent these infections. And um, 
it's been touched upon before, but one of our major strengths is around diagnostics. And we're doing a lot of work around decision support and how we can use supervised machine learning in decision support, clinical decision support at lots of different levels, and also moving away from a single static test, but more dynamic ones that bring in all sorts of variables to help with optimizing treatments. So I think there's a lot of strengths there, but I think we need to shift from just looking at new drugs, which is very exciting for pharma, a very nice thing to think about. But if we really want to get to grips with this, we need to look at how we can use our agents better. Okay, thanks. Hey. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, as an immunologist, I'm going to put in the plug for um, immunology and actually tackling infection by learning from human disease. Um, and I think the one thing that's common um, for a lot of infectious diseases is that we have people that recover um, and that we can learn from this recovery um, to, to, to tr come up with treatments. And I really want to talk here now about like monoclonal antibodies. Um, I think this is what I would prioritize uh, because from people who have recovered from infections, we can, we've now got the technologies in place to study their response and copy that response. Um, and that can be translated into treatments. It can be translated into treatments in the short term, it can be translated into treatments in the long term. And pre prior to this, people have said, oh, it's too expensive. It will never be affordable for low and uh, middle income countries, but that's changing day by day and prices are coming down. So my, my plug would be to work broadly on monoclonal antibody therapies. Um, these are good for short term. They help us in the short term while research is continuing to find other treatments. One can um, identify monoclonals across a panel of diseases. You know, we could do it for COVID, we could do it for malaria, we can do it for other infections. So I think that this is a gap that we need to fill in the UK. Um, and I think Imperial College is in a very good position to do this. Um, I think that needs to be coupled with the ability to translate quickly um, so that it's not an academic activity but that you've got the partnerships in place that would allow you to move uh, promising monoclonal therapy um, into clinic um, in good speed. So that's uh, that's what I would like to add. Thank you. OK, thanks. Molly. Yeah, I'm obviously really excited about the potential of diagnostics and how can we um, really translate some of the things we've learned from applications in other areas like um, oncology and cardiovascular disease. Um, but alongside that, I'm also um, very, very motivated by thinking about how we can use uh, materials and new types of materials um, in uh, antiviral and also antimicrobial, potentially antifungal um, applications. Um, so as well as thinking about uh, small molecule therapeutics, can we actually design uh, materials that have really robust um, uh, antiviral, antimicrobial activity and, and uh, perhaps um, less um, or, or at least some control over uh, the amount of resistance that that um, would incur from the use of those sort of materials. And I think Imperial's really well placed for that because of the strong engineering background we have um, in designing material systems and also um, the UK Smart Materials Hub that um, I direct, which is uh, led from Imperial College. And I hope we'll work really closely with this new institute. Great. Thanks. So I'm going to go to Jake and then Wendy, same question. What are, what do you see as the key challenges going forward? I mean, I, I'd uh, clearly like to make a selfish plug for malaria, which I work on, which I think is still one of the massive unmet uh, challenges that humanity faces. Um, it holds back economies, which I think once they are released from the burden of malaria can become you know, better running economies, have a smaller climate footprint, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think, I think that, that if you address malaria, you have the knock on effect of many things. But I think also malaria also highlights for me um, an area that I know many people are interested in, which is this concept of one health. This idea that if you reach out to different areas of, of, of uh, um, uh, research, 
that you can have incredible benefits on human health. If you look after veterinary diseases, um, um, if you look after animal health, there's a great study that came out of Imperial recently on rabies, that if you treat animals, you can actually really help to reduce local rates of rabies. And obviously that speaks to climate as well. And, and then I think the last area that, that I'm, I'm conscious Imperial has a real strength in, but is something um, that I feel I, I need much more help with and I think is a real area um, uh, that we should be focusing on is, is, is sort of handling data. We're all kind of drowning in data. And I think research that helps us uh, navigate those you know, extensive data sets and, and make sense of them using machine learning, artificial intelligence, I think those are going to be at the fore. And if I'm allowed one more kind of plug, it would be to those of you who know me, I, I quite like living in contradiction. And, and I really like the idea of slow science too. And I think there's, there is this sort of fascination with the most expensive and the biggest and the wildest. But actually, we, we also need a steady trickle of really good quality slow science going on in the background, because that really is our insurance policy for the unknown. Um, so I think I've almost told you to fund it. What would you what would you fund? I'd, I'd fund everything. Um, <laughs> the, the, the big the big challenges we face now, but but I think also being mindful of, of, of the slow scholarship of science that we always need to have um, in all areas of uh, investigation. Excellent. I think that's an important point, Jake. We'll probably come back to that balance between you know underpinning ongoing science versus reactive challenge led discoveries. I think is is an important one to make. Wendy, you're going to give us some words of wisdom on the challenges ahead. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think we can take some words of wisdom actually from the Wellcome Trust, who I think have been very clever in identifying infectious disease and climate change, for example, as two key priorities for the coming decades. Um, I mean, reiterating what Jake was saying, of course, malaria is a is a vector borne disease. And I think we have to the world has to wake up a little bit to the possibility that vector borne diseases are going to become more and more important. And it's not going to be just someone else's problem. Uh, if we see climate change and, and expansion of vectors into new territories, the, the next pandemic may not be a respiratory virus pandemic, but may be one spread by um, insects. Um, so I, I identify that as, as actually a chronically underfunded area of research currently and, and a direction in which we ought to be investing now in order to be better prepared. Um, so that would be one of the things on my top list, which is quite a specific area to move into. And then I, I suppose the other thing I perhaps could take the liberty of, of approaching one of the, the questions that's posted in the Q&A about human challenge. So this is more of an approach really than a focus area for research, but the, but the approach of using human challenge uh, is something that Imperial has been building expertise in for, for many years now and is really you know, world leading. And I think that there is really a, a role for taking these sort of sometimes slightly risky or controversial approaches, but, but really sort of getting out there and making sure that you can, uh, you know, sort of push some boundaries and, and, and go for it with that kind of um, uh, approach. So, yeah, I think that uh, what we need to be aware of are where are the, the likely areas that we need to be investing in and then what are the best technologies. Coming back to one of the things that Faith was saying about immunology guiding the way, the other thing that we're really building expertise in and I'd like to see us grow is genetics. Uh, identifying the difference in people's outcome of infection due to their genetics. Uh, is really now ripe and you know the the discovery that certain individuals are more susceptible to severe disease from COVID but many other infectious diseases can really lead the way in not only working out who needs extra help who needs to be high up on the priority for vaccines once we've first got them but also for new therapeutics that that sort of rely on the knowledge that's gained from those genetic studies. Okay. Thank you. I think I'm going to bring Charles in on, on some of these Im immuno, immunology and immunotherapy questions just to add your thoughts, Charles, but also to note in the in the Q&A that we have a question from John. And so if you could touch on this as well, and then maybe Robin could also answer. Could the vaccine technologies that have come to the forefront in the last two years be used to develop vaccines against antibiotic resistant infections, thus sparing antimicrobials and, and thinking also about passive immunotherapy against bacterial infections um, and how that might feed in? So Charles first. Uh, well, thank you very much. That is precisely the point that I was just going to raise, that it, this has been an idea that's been championed for a few years by some very 
eminent uh, people such as D uh, Professor Rino Rapuoli, who is also a, a member of Imperial College, and um, uh, as well as in GSK, championing the idea that, of course, as Faith was saying uh, in, and, uh, and implying, the biggest success in controlling any infectious disease is from our immune system. The reason we are here is because we have evolved these remarkably efficient immune systems that are able to combat any hitherto unknown uh, agent, such as a new virus or bacterium. And in the great uh, majority of cases, we're able to control them very well. Uh, the point about uh, Wendy's point of genetics is also absolutely key. In fact, the reason that I'm working on infectious disease myself is because I became fascinated by the different outcomes in different people from exactly the same infectious agent. So these are really absolutely key. Uh, just finally, I want to emphasize that one of the objectives of the Institute of Infection in the near future is to uh, initiate very focused workshops with some of the other centers of excellence in Imperial, notably, for example, the Grantham Institute of Climate Change, in order to explore, explore the overlap area and to decide to identify areas where further research is needed and, and then just to emphasize uh, how happy we are to hear Julia Gillard's emphasis on the need to continue not only the applied research, but the basic research, because nearly always this is where the genuine innovation comes from and you can't anticipate it. Thank you. I think I think we're all in heated agreement with Julia's point there. Robin and then Peter, I think, wants to come in as well. Yes, so, I mean, to address can vaccines work in the antimicrobial resistance space? I think for sure they have an important role to play there. But I think we need to remember that actually where that's most often an issue is with patients in hospital, often the very young, the very old, the immunosuppressed. And so we need technology that's really very much designed for those at risk populations. Um, and that uh, needs a, a real uh, focus and injection of research. It's not so much developing a, a vaccine strategy that's for everybody. I think increasingly we will start to see uh, targeted approaches. Um, and the other area that I think we will, we hopefully will realise in the coming years is the, the kind of mixing of the use of, of antibodies that can also have a role to play in the antimicrobial space, but ways to deliver antibodies with new technologies, whether that's genetic technologies using viral vectors so that it's faster, more cost effective um, and more efficient. OK, thanks, Peter. Yeah, so just to, to add to to what uh, what Faith was saying about the use of antibodies and what Charles was saying about the um, about the what immunology has has done for us, I think you know it's remarkable that actually the therapies that have been proven to work have been things like you know blocking IL six interleukin six with tocilizumab and the use of steroids. You know, so it's suppressing elements of the host immune response rather than remdesivir, uh, an antiviral, which actually in many large trials has not worked at all. So I think, you know, the use of, of immunological knowledge to modify disease is something which has been a most extraordinary discovery. OK, thanks. I think Alison wants to come back in. So thank you. I. I I, I wouldn't mind expanding this a little bit. I think the opportunities for immunotherapy, vaccines, and the mixture of how we can use um, immune approaches as well as um, anti-infectives to not just treat but prevent is really important. But it, it, it brings us on to an area that we really are not touching upon adequately, and that's infection prevention strategies. I mean, talking about um, using vaccines or, you know, immune approaches to protect patients when they get admitted to hospital or when they need to go for a particular surgical procedure or when they need to go to um, into intensive care. I mean, I really think that's fantastic, but we also should think about preventing those infections to begin with. And there's an enormous amount of research that can be done around infection prevention, as well as, as targeted therapy for individual um, individual patients. And 
you know, just to flag that, you know, it's around 30% of antimicrobials that are used in healthcare are used to actually treat infections that are acquired in healthcare. So can we just, you know, think about how we, um, you know, how we frame some of this research to actually um, prevent infections as well as treating them and, and treating them well? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alison. And I think that we are going to touch in a little while on, on science policy, I think, and how scientists can shape and influence science policy and advice. And I think that's a key that that becomes a key question there. I just wanted to look at the couple of questions that we've got in the Q&A. Um, um, one that asks, uh, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit, so I'm going to come to, to Neil first um, and, and then maybe Robin. But does the panel think that um, that developed countries are doing the best to support developing countries and, and the, the, the audience member asked specifically on vaccines, but I think more generally, how is knowledge that we are developing in, 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 in the developed nations being adequately translated to help the developed world so we have a truly global and equitable response? Yes, yeah, an interesting challenge. I don't think this pandemic has necessarily been the shining example of that. Though a lot has been done. Um, the COVAX initiative had many good intentions, a reasonable amount of funding behind it, but unfortunately a lot of this pandemic has been marked by understandable, and it shouldn't be criticised too much, nationalism in terms of, of the response. How do we learn lessons from that? Well, I think some of those lessons are being learned very rapidly by um, low and middle income countries, that namely there's nothing better than actually having your own capacity um, to uh, respond to threats and sharing knowledge, certainly, and sharing techniques and, and the tech <coughs> and the science base is, is critically important. But we, we need to have a disseminated manufacturing capacity, certainly for countermeasures. Um, we have some prime examples of that clearly with India, with Brazil to some extent, but relatively little in, in low income countries in sub-Saharan Africa. But I think that will change. And so I think we do need to move away from the, let's say, post-colonial approach to global health, which is, has predominated, I mean, through much of my professional career, um, towards much more of a genuine partnership where, yes, we, we provide enabling capacity building, but we are not necessarily providing the products themselves at the end of the day. Um, that technology base is being developed within low and middle income countries themselves. Thanks. Robin? I mean, one can always do more and, and do better. I think the most important thing is for us to recognise where the, the bottlenecks and the short shortages of getting vaccines to people who need it have occurred and build on that experience. Um, and part of it is, is just manufacturing capacity, but an awful lot of it is in the supply chain logistics um, you know, the fact that we're still putting vaccines into glass vials and using needles um, is, is, you know, something that could greatly change with new technologies. You, if you had something that was more robust, um, that could be, you know, potentially airdropped into situations, you can imagine trying to get hold of a COVID vaccine in a war zone is particularly difficult. Uh, getting access to Ebola vaccines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo was a significant challenge in areas of you know, severe uh, violence and instability. So those things need to be uh, solved and solved with a technical fix that is relevant to the situation. Often as scientists, I think we often design things that are exciting and interesting, but aren't actually always looking for the solution that's needed or asking the people who need the solution what they need and I think that also needs to be factored into to the future planning. Okay thanks I think Faith wanted to come in on, on low middle income countries and then I'm going to come to you Jake from an institute perspective. Faith. Thank you um, I just want to add that um, you know I agree with what the previous speakers have said um, in terms of capacity strengthening I want to add that um, we've got to begin to have a long-term strategy for the inequity that exists um, and you know a lot of the solutions that we think about are quick fix when a pandemic we need a problem now and that's good but we also need to begin to stretch 
to long term thinking about strengthening capacity. And I really want to put in a plug for training scientists because there is no reason why scientists in Africa should not be designing and manufacturing vaccines. Um, it's not for lack of brain capacity, um, but as long as we keep putting a band aid kind of fix, well, that continues. Um, we need to tackle the problem at its root. Um, can we strengthen the training of scientists in Africa? And I think that um, Imperial College has a role to play, as many other partners, in really thinking long term about um, tackling inequity um, in education, essentially, um, and in science. Thanks. Thanks. I think that's a really important point. And I think you're talking a little bit there of faith, not just about expanding expertise across the globe, but about building resilience more generally by having a better trained workforce all over the world. And, and that investment, and I think Wendy talked about it, you know, science during peace times actually is building up that that base. Um, Jake, I want to turn to you from an institute perspective. So the, in response to that question about helping, you know, the Develop in developing nations, but also there's a couple of questions that speak to whether there are the appropriate structures that you are building the Institute to enable those international partnerships and also how the Institute might help democratise science in this space. So not just international partners, but citizens being involved in having agency, I guess, and advocacy within the Institute. Yeah, so um, well, well, maybe I'll start. I, I, well, so one of our key goals as a new Institute is to develop um, all of our programs from the outset with with many of these concepts in mind. So, for example, when we've talked about developing an, an online master's course, one of the ideas is that this would be equitable globally so that we really would be able to have cohorts of students being trained across the remit of infection science from everywhere around the world and really build up a community of well trained um, um, graduates who are really excited and empowered in the infection space. Um, then I guess there's sort of at the, at the level of the institute, we're really keen on developing partnerships. We've already got some partnerships being developed with other institutes around the world. And really, I mean, in some ways, we have a, a very easy task in tapping into a lot of the collaborations that are already very much in place from Imperial College with, you know, across the continents around the world, work with scientists working in many, um, many other low middle income countries. Um, and also, um, you know, uh, with stations out there, whether it's in East Africa, Southeast Asia, where we really are working with the researchers there, not bringing our research to them. And I guess just a, a last plug to go out there is that one, one community that's come out of Imperial is this uh, Digital Diagnostics for Africa community, which has been a partnership developed specifically with um, uh, African researchers. And one of the things there is where we it very quickly became clear that if you develop something really fantastic in tech and you bring it to the field, Often it, the the digital infrastructure is not there, so you really need to work with your with your partners out in the field to really understand how those things are going to be implemented and used to their to their full capacity. So working with our international partners, developing those partnerships and training the students of the future, I think is one way the institute can certainly act in that space. Okay, thank you, Peter. I'm going to turn to you if you don't mind and, and ask you. There's a question from anonymous in the, in the Q and A. Could the panel offer any thoughts on the scale of disinformation and the anti-vax sentiment that has prevailed in a significant micro minority of the world? What have we done right? And what have we done wrong? And and I guess this speaks a little bit to organisations like this institute as in thought leadership and convening voice. And how do how do we counter? I guess the disinformation and what what's the role of places like this in in doing that? It's an enormously important and really difficult question. You know, I, I do wonder where this disinformation is coming from sometimes. It, it seems almost to have no basis in rationality or sometimes there's a little thread of, of information which leads to some night's move um, conclusion which is completely off beam. And how that happens I think is a vitally important thing to understand but I think we need to partner with people in social sciences and psychology and so on to really understand this, but also to understand how information is spread globally and how um, how how social networks work. It's it's such an important question because it can completely knock us off course if we get this wrong and it almost has. And I think it, once um, this sort of thing becomes politicized, it's very hard to bring it back on track. I mean, I think you know, those of us who have been doing a lot of science communication, and there are many of us on this call, 
you know, I think we do our best to try and get the message out there. And, you know, I think the journalists have done really well, actually, in terms of making sure that um, that science is communicated well. And the Science Media Centre, I think, deserve a lot of credit for what they've done in this country. They've been enormously influential. Okay, I think Neil wanted to come in. Yes, I would just echo Peter's points. I think as a university, our clear role, and I think we've done it well, is to communicate science in a objective and transparent way. Um, we'll come on to this next point. There's an interesting, I mean, try to avoid being uh, overtly political, let's say expressing opinions as compared with the science we do. I personally view that's not our role to really express objective opinions. Um, and I think be reasonably aggressive at trying to counter, let's say, clear inaccuracies as we have done in the press and the mainstream media um, throughout um, the as we have done throughout the pandemic. I think the biggest challenge clearly is the social media space. Um, I'm not sure as a university we can do much about that except contribute to the research which is ongoing in our computer science department and many around the world to understand the dynamics of that. Um, but I think I would like Peter be positive that yes there has been, it has affected probably the view and dominated the views of maybe five, ten percent of the population in this country but that is only five and ten percent and most people have been very appreciative of the science we collectively have done and of the benefits vaccines uh, give. And it also, I'd say, this pro problem is a long-term problem. It started before the pandemic and will carry on after it. It is a problem in other areas of, of science as well, climate change as being another example. And we just have to do the best we can to, clear, I think, clearly communicate the science. Thanks. Julia, I wonder if I could bring you in this also from a, you know, your background also in, in politics as well as leading the Wellcome Foundation, the Wellcome Trust. How difficult does I guess this climate of disinformation make it from a policy perspective we're going to come on to talk a little bit more about science and policy but just this particular this particular issue of disinformation and the challenges that it brings uh, well I would love it if I had all of the answers to this and I'd certainly be sharing them if I did <laughs> but unfortunately I don't uh, having said that I'd like to start with Neil's uh, last point uh, which is we shouldn't talk down what has been achieved. I mean, we came into this pandemic uh, from an era in which uh, there were uh, much dismissing of science and evidence, uh, where there had been climate gate and all the rest of it. Uh, and we came into this, I think, with science having been marginalised in many ways. And this has put science back at the centre. And overwhelmingly, I think people have hung off every word from scientists and chief medical officers and others to try and work out what to do next and how to keep their families safe. And so that is a net advantage, I think, as we go into the next period. Uh, having said that, I think that there are some regulatory issues with the social media companies uh, that need to be resolved, not only because of public health information, but more generally because of the uh, clear discriminatory content that comes to the surface on social media. Uh, the evidence overwhelmingly shows that uh, women, that people of colour are those who are abused on social media. So there are things that we need to do there. And then I think for the scientific community, there are some reflections about how uh, we best make available information in fast changing times. And I think where it's been most difficult is when people have been asked because of the demands of the era and how quickly the pandemic was emerging uh, to you know, make a decision that is in advance of the evidence but needed to be made. Uh, you know, people making their best judgment on what they do know because it's not like everybody had years and years to do the research before making the public health calls. I do think we've got to be in a situation where we're having as sophisticated a conversation as possible about you know, how people are making those decisions, why they're making those decisions that quickly, um, and how that is in the interests of the public to try and get things uh, as best as they can. 
I think as the inevitable inquiries come around into pandemic handling, uh, we'll have a lot of time to have that conversation about what it's like to make decisions in real time with imperfect information. And we shouldn't shy away from that. We should be trying to unpack that so that when future challenges come, people will understand that that's the sort of scenario people are working in. Okay, thanks. So I'd just like to kind of broaden this discussion a little bit and think more about science informing policy and how can science advice to government be improved? Can it be imp can it be improved? How can it be improved? How can we better think about, I guess, training scientists to engage in policy discussions? Um, what does government need from scientists? And and I wanted to touch a little bit on Neil's point about opinion versus fact and and that. I guess, question of science consensus being delivered and scientific evidence for evidence based or evidence informed policy. Um, so, Neil, do you want to maybe start that and then I'll come back to Julia again? Since, since you said you I'll come back to Julia. That nice small question to address. Um, <laughs> I think I think one thing is I don't have, first of all, I don't have an answer to this and there's no perfect system, but it is interesting comparing across the world. We we have a tendency to look inwards, particularly we have done certainly during the pandemic. And so the tendency to look at the UK system, which is very sophisticated, but has some pluses and minuses and maybe not concentrate on other countries' experiences. I think the countries where um, science advice has worked well is where they've drawn on a not just a single voice, but a number of voices. Uh, and where the leadership of those countries has wanted to hear you know the best science um, not necessarily to say this is the policy which should be adopted but to understand what is going on and the, and the countries which have done the worst are frankly where the leadership has not been driven by has been driven ideologically rather than um, by by the evidence i think focusing on on the uk we have developed over the course of this pandemic a very sophisticated scientific advisory structure for the pandemic, understandably so, with thousands of scientists feeding into it. Even at the earlier stages of the pandemic, there were always, let's say, dozens, if not hundreds of scientists feeding in. Um, that can be missing. The percep public perception can be quite a different one, but the reality has been, you know, a large proportion of the scientists with expertise in this area have been informing policy. So that comes on to the issue of what does informing policy mean? Um, and here I, both in, in how I interact with the media and, and with, let's say, civil servants and policy makers, I think I personally view my role as to give an objective opinion of you know, what is happening in the pandemic, what do we understand about the virus epidemiologically, and what are the range of possible policy options and what might their consequences be, rather than saying this is what you should do. And that's where I think one is crossing the line from, from science advice to really you know, trying to determine policy. And I think most scientists have, have kept the right side of the line, but not all on, on either side of the debate. And that does muddy the waters somewhat. I think the other thing we have in this country, which is fairly unique, is that all science advice is mediated via, well, nearly all science advice is mediated through two people, the chief medical officer and, and chief scientific advisor, Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance, who have to say have done a fa fantastic job but it puts a enormous pressure on those roles. And we may want to consider whether there are ways to maintain that kind of objective interface between the scientific community and government, which still broaden out the, the, you know, the nature of the communication. I think the other thing is, is from the politician's point of view and the perspective, I think this government has become much more informed consumers of scientific advice as the pandemic has unfolded, a crash course in epidemiology, one might put it, and therefore we're in a very different place in this country now than we were in March of last year, a much better place, I should say, in terms of understanding how this pandemic works and, and avoiding the, for things like what was always, in my view, a false dichotomy of 
wanting to save the economy versus wanting to control the virus. I think we have a much better understanding across all areas of the political spectrum that these two things are not really in opposition. And looking at the kind of global experience of this virus, the countries which have done the best have also suffered least economically. Thanks. So, Julia, I'm going to come to you. I, I know many of the members of this panel, I'll come to you, to you next, have been involved, you know, very actively, almost daily over the last 18 months in thinking about science and government advice. But, Julia, if you could, you know, take a very high level approach, and I don't, you know, I'm not expecting you to come around any particular places that did it well or didn't do it well, but what is what makes good scientific advice? And I guess what's the role of the scientists and scientific communities in 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 helping to inform policy? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I guess I would say from my experience uh, in government, which uh, happily wasn't during the era of a pandemic, uh, but uh, from my experience, I mean, politicians are very time poor uh, and uh, bulging in trays always uh, multiplied when we're living in times like this. And so advice that can be clear, uh, synthesised, can be absorbed, uh, can be intelligible, and I think we underestimate often how uh, different scientific language is from everyday language. And so to do the translation uh, across from the science speak to uh, understanding by people who aren't scientists, uh, all of that really matters. And I think Neil's observation is right, that this is a muscle, a policy muscle that gets uh, stronger by working it out. Um, obviously, it's been uh, worked very hard uh, over the last uh, 16 months or uh, however long since uh, uh, the pandemic started. Uh, but we shouldn't leave it from crisis to crisis to work that muscle. I think it's really important uh, that there are uh, standing ways of the scientific community engaging with politicians, uh, making sure that those systems are practised uh, that they're understood on both sides. And so when it does get to a really pressurised period like this, you're not coming off a standing start. And if I could offer one observation, um, I think when we uh, get to analyse responses around the world, uh, governments that have done preparedness exercises on public health emergencies, including pandemics, uh, will have been seen to have done better than governments who didn't do those exercises over time, because it's, it's a simple working out of that muscle. Um, I would also agree with the reflection Neil made. Ultimately, it does take two to tango in this, um, and a scientist can be off offering the most uh, rational, clear advice possible. Uh, but if you have politicians that uh, have decided for whatever reason, uh, usually some form of hyperpartisanship, that they're not interested in listening to the advice or that they uh, wrongly think that the uh, a, you know the virus is going to cower in front of their macho bluster uh, then uh, ultimately you're not going to get very far and we've certainly seen some examples of that around the world um, maybe because we have seen those examples uh, that you know the voting public and politicians of the future are going to learn from that i did make the observation before that i thought science had been marginalized before the pandemic I think another thing that was happening before the pandemic is it was possible for people to think, well, it doesn't really matter who's in government because government doesn't make much of a difference to my life. Um, I think that this era has probably reinforced with uh, voting populations in democracies that actually the quality of government can be the difference between living and dying when it really gets hard. And hopefully that's um, going to drive a new sense of responsibility and engagement when people turn out to vote and the choices that they make. Thanks, that's really helpful. I'm going to now go to um, Charles and then Wendy and then Peter just to give some of their reflections on this scope. But I will just note that at Imperial, if those of us are aware of it, we do have the forum, which is our policy unit, which is really trying to endeavour to make better connections between scientists and policymakers and government. And, and I know many of the people on this roundtable have been involved with the forum over the last year and many events. So Charles, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of this discussion has focused on the pandemic. And this is why so many of us are so motivated to speak about the role of uh, scientists in, in policy advice to government. Um, there have been many, uh, now it is planned to set up many pandemic preparedness groups. 
to so-called learn the lessons from the pandemic and apply them to the future. What bothers me about this is that there have been innumerable pandemic preparedness groups set up over the last 20 years or more. And indeed, I was on one myself for the Department of Health in the UK uh, in 2010, which is called the Pandemic Influenza Group, or PIG for short. But what I think we, we need to focus on is why have the lessons not been learnt? Why have they, or rather, not been adequately acted on? And I think what this does is shine a light on this the matter we're discussing, the, the so-called dividing line between objective science and policy. Now, Neil has emphasised this, and in the, the various groups that I've been involved in, we have been repeatedly uh, advised by our chief of policy to in, in the Royal Society not to cross this line that uh, Neil identified between science and policy. That it's well known that uh, Churchill, uh, Churchill said scientists should be on tap but not on top. And similarly, <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher said that advisors advise and ministers decide. But what I have come to believe is that this dividing line between science objective science and policy is not always so clear cut. I just want to draw very briefly an analogy. When a patient is admitted unconscious into casualty, into A&E, an, an inexperienced doctor, newly qualified doctor, will immediately start to carry out a certain number of routine examinations and tests, like examining the nervous system and, and so on. When an experienced doctor comes into the room, they will immediately go to a small number of key tests and indicators. For example, to look at the blood sugar in case it's a diabetic who's in diabetic coma, to identify a small number of potentially reversible factors that can be acted on immediately. I think what we need in government is people who are able to understand immediately and appreciate the, the scientific basis, but also the urgency and the importance of key pieces of scientific evidence so that we are not seen as just uh, another voice. You can't you can't decide uh, these difficult decisions of, of uh, policy by a democratic vote. You have to decide who it is you're going to trust. So I think that that's what I've uh, been increasingly borne in on me in the last few in the last months and indeed last week I was asked to speak uh, on behalf of the Royal Society to science and engineering fast streamers going into the civil service to try and advise them how as it were to get through to ministers it's it's an extremely difficult problem as Neil has said and there's no simple solution. Charles, while, while, I, while you've just mentioned that, so Anonymous has just posted in the Q&A, would politicians benefit from greater scientific statistical literacy so they can better weigh up the scientific evidence? So we just talked, I mean, we talked a lot about communication, how scientists have to communicate, and, and both Neil and Julie mentioned yeah. that communicating it in you know, digestible, tractable information. Yeah. Is there an onus on the other side to get better at understanding science? And, 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 and do we have a role in that training process? Yeah. Uh, the answer is yes and yes. We need to help them to understand how to assess the scientific evidence uh, as we see it. Uh, of course, no one is, is pretending that these policy decisions are easy. They're fearfully complex and difficult. And there are many factors that need to be taken into consideration. But early on in the pandemic, about a year ago, relatively early on, uh, I was on one uh, very good webinar where there are a number of uh, eminent speakers, one of whom was another former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm yeah. Turnbull, who spoke very eloquently. Um, another was the former Vice President of Taiwan. Now, in the early days of the pandemic, Taiwan did extremely well in controlling the uh, spread of the coronavirus. It's had more problems since with the more infectious variants, like many other countries. But early on, they did extremely well. And we asked Professor uh, Chen, uh, his name is, um, why ta Taiwan had done so well. And he responded in a very straightforward and very modest, uh, self-effacing way. He was, had been, as I say, the vice president of Taiwan. And he said, 
uh, one of the reasons was in the SARS epidemic of 2003, we decided, we identified what had to be done. And this time we put it into effect. We did it. Now, not coincidentally, Vice President Chen is a professor of epidemiology. So I think it just emphasizes to me the point that in government, it helps to have people who, with a genuine deep understanding of, as I said, the significance, the urgency and the importance of the scientific evidence. I, I completely agree. Neil, what is your opinion? Go ahead, Neil. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, and there are things we are contributing to here at Imperial to do that. You mentioned the forum already, Mary, but also two-way secondments. Um, I mean, the Royal Society has run a very good partnering scheme between MPs and um, young early career scientists and a number of people in the centre I run have participated in that, but also secondments into government departments. And I actually think UKHSA, the Health Security Agency, which is replacing PHE, has very encouragingly have has a very open attitude towards seconding people temporarily or long term from academia in those joint appointments. And so I think there will become more opportunity to interact both with politicians directly, but also with people within the civil service. OK, thanks. I think, Faith, you wanted to come in on this. Um, yes, I want to make a point that, um, you know, but, but that might uh, annoy my colleagues, but I think that um, scientists, um, we are, we've put ourselves on a pedestal um, where we know based on the science. And I think that um, it's worth reflecting that, you know, on given some scientific facts, sometimes things are really clear and it's easy to have a nice consensus on it. But taking the example of COVID, sometimes things have really not been clear. And even as scientists, we've um, we've debated amongst ourselves and sometimes we've failed to come to consensus. So I think that um, accepting that we are also vulnerable and that we make our best, you know, we make the best judgment based on the data as we see it, um, I think is, to me is also a lesson that we have to take going forward and certainly for the public looking at us there's been loss of trust because these scientists said this these scientists said that and i think we just also just have to acknowledge it's complex and it's not straightforward and we don't always have all the answers and we should be able to face up to that thanks Thank you, I think, and I think that's a really important point. We're very nearly out of time, so I'm going to just go back to the new Institute Directors, Charles and Jake, and I'm going to remind you of the Imperial College mission to achieve enduring excellence in research and education in science, engineering, medicine and business for the benefit of society. So in 10 years time, what will this Institute have achieved for the benefit of society? And, and, Charles, and I'm, expecting you to think, I'm expecting you to think big. One thing I have learnt from the Christmas edition of Nature magazine is never to make scientific predictions because they always miss the point. But in a way, that makes the point that scientific discovery is unpredictable. What really makes the difference is the unpredictable uh, novelty that comes much of it from basic uh, blue sky research. But I think that what, uh, I mean, to answer your question, what we will have done is accelerate the progress in both applied and basic research by bringing people together and making them talk to each other across the divide between chemical engineering and basic biology, for example, to get them to think about problems where they think they might be able to offer a solution, but have no idea how to approach it in either side. So we need to get people in chemical engineering who are interested to see if they can apply their knowledge and expertise to infection and vice versa, people in infection who think maybe I need a chemical engineer to help me solve this. But more to the point, if we bring people together, they will discover that they need the other side, even if they didn't know it to start with. 
And we want to catalyse that realisation. So that's what I hope we'll achieve. So your tangible outcome is effectively a new community yeah. that thinks differently and works together differently. And is more productive. OK, Jake, anything to add? Not really, actually, just to sort of reinforce it. I mean, I think the way we um, accelerate towards, I mean, the 10 year vision is, is what's going to be in 10 years. Are we going to, if we can get there quicker, um, that acceleration will come from what I like to call the how and the wow. The how is the scientist who's sitting there thinking, how on earth am I going to solve this problem? And that by bridging those connections across the community, they find people who can help them solve that how. How do I design that machine that will be able to test that parameter that I don't know how to test? And also the wow of just having people turning up to each other's talks, creating that community and creating that global community as well, where you're exposed to ideas that you never dreamed were even possible. And then suddenly you can see a vision of your research in a completely different light. So I think that acceleration comes from that sort of integration of that, of that community. And just speaking to that community, I think in 10 years time, if we've built both an internal community, but also a global alumni of people who are connected and educated in, in, in infection. And I think ed education and infection could be for somebody who is in policy or is in politics, who wants to take a year out, do a master's in, in, in infection to really learn the language of infection for their particular discipline, industry, uh, uh, workplace. I mean, I think that would be an incredible achievement if people could look to sort of say, I, I came through the imperial process, the, the imperial and institute infection, maybe master's progress, maybe a PhD, maybe I was a research fellow and, and create that sort of global oneness. So I think we, we can't really say where we'll be, but 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 hopefully wherever wherever that is in 10 years time is an accelerated vision of, of, of what's possible now. OK, and um, on that note, I'm here by closing the panel discussion and I really just want to thank everyone on the panel for their really insightful and enthusiastic and thoughtful and honest contributions actually. I do apologise if we didn't get to your question in the Q&A. Um, hopefully some of those will be answered tomorrow if you're attending some of the events tomorrow um, and I'm going to hand back to Jake and Charles for the wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mary, for uh, sharing a really very interesting discussion. Uh, we could have gone on for, for days, if not weeks, on these very complex points. Uh, I think it just remains for, for me, on behalf of the Institute of Infection, to thank Julia Gillard again for her strong words of support and encouragement. Also to thank the members of the panel for taking time away from their television commitments and appearances to take part in what was a fascinating discussion. And most uh, last to, to thank the many who've worked so hard to bring the Institute of Infection into existence, and particularly those who helped in organizing this two day launch event. And especially I'd like to mention Mel Bratnam, Shona Blair and Al McCartney. Thanks again. Yeah, so I'll just uh, say thank you also and, and uh, um, just to remind people that the uh, launch event continues tomorrow with a jam packed a program of back-to-back uh, -back talks across the disciplines of infection. So please do 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 join us. Um, come come along and be sort of dazzled by the breadth of science. And uh, um, you can also f follow on the the YouTube channel. And uh, there's also been lots of Twitter activity about the launch event. So again, say um, to say thank you. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing as many of you as possible tomorrow. <laughs>